Hi everybody and welcome to this lecture uh, in week three. Um, in this short talk I'm going to say a little bit about disability, poverty and the family, how disability works in families uh, and how its disadvantaging effects interact with those of poverty. Um, so to start off, um, when we see disability in a family, childhood disability particularly, um, we quite often regard it as um, so important that it sometimes seems like the only important thing for us to take notice of. And while um, disability in families and disability in childhood is of course very important and it does present a very real adversity to families, when we're talking about families living in poverty, what I've discovered in my research is that often disability, um, childhood disability is only one of a complex set of problems that these families face. It is a problem though that can interact with others and it's in that interaction um, between the demands made by childhood disability and other kinds of adversity. When we understand that interaction, we understand more about what it is that these families face. Um, <clears throat> so in the literature uh, over quite a period now, uh, there's been the idea, we find the idea of poverty and disability in families interacting in what's called a vicious cycle, it's known as a vicious cycle. And by that, uh, we mean that they support one another. Um, in other words, living in poverty uh, can create disability, it leads to disability because of uh, a range of disadvantaging circumstances um, involved with living in poverty. And um, while at the same time, um, having a disability, be it in childhood or adulthood, uh, has disadvantaging effects which, uh, which lead to poverty or can worsen poverty. And so the literature there is, is clear, <clears throat> the evidence we have is clear, is that the families with a, with a child who has a disability um, are more likely to be poor, that's the first point, they're more likely to be living in poverty. But secondly, they're also less likely to escape poverty and we know that um, you know escaping poverty and moving up uh, the socioeconomic ladder uh, is extremely difficult uh, and in a sense unlikely for for most families living in poverty what we know is that if it's if that family has a child with a disability it's even less likely it's even harder so families are more likely to be poor and they're less likely to be able to find a way to escape the poverty cycle. Um, the reasons for that uh, are because are many, um, but we can begin by thinking about how disability in childhood leads to extra expenses for, for families. And um, the closer we look, uh, the more we find um, the ways in which disability in childhood um, can complicate and add to a, a family socioeconomic challenges. Beginning, I mean, we begin by, with, with the issue of transport. And very often, um, if there's a child with a disability, it may mean that uh, there are different or uh, increased requirements for transportation, um, which the family has. It may be transport to and from a hospital um, to, have physiotherapy for a child with a physical disability. It may be um, transport to and from a special school, which is situated much further away um, from the home uh, than the neighborhood school. Um, it may be transport in terms of <clears throat> regularly having to fetch medication, for chronic medication for a child. Um, if we study families who live in poverty, we know that transportation is often a very substantial expense that families spend a surprisingly high proportion of their low income on. And so the additional need for transportation with a child with a disability is, a, is an important factor. Add to that um, things like the cost of medication, chronic medication for, for children who have you know, whatever impairment, um, they may have a chronic illness um, and that medication is an added expense. So children with disabilities may need special foods, they may have allergies or not be able to eat regular food um, and may require special foods, which again are going to cost money. 
Add to that the possibility of children needing assistive devices, <clears throat> some of which may be available through the state healthcare system. Many, in, in many areas, these won't be available or it'll, it'll be very difficult to access them. Those assistive devices then will have to be bought and they will cost money. Something a little bit more subtle, but extremely important is how in families where there's a child with a disability, it's likely that the labor power of adults in that family will be reduced. Well, what do I mean by that? If you have a child who, for example, has a severe physical impairment, it's likely that that child will need a lot of care. Um, you know, care with activities of daily living, uh, with uh, getting up, bathing, dressing, with eating, with toileting. Um, and that care uh, represents labor, um, which often means that a, an adult in the household might, will be unable to find work or unable to work, to do gainful work out there on the, in the employment market because uh, because of the need to to care for a child and so the the overall income then of the household is reduced slide number two um for a range of reasons disability in childhood is also more likely in poor communities so we see the other side of the cycle um, where disability causes poverty, but poverty also causes disability, and we're looking at it from the other the other angle now. So, why is it more likely that why is childhood disability more likely in in communities living in poverty? Well, the first factor is the likelihood of less adequate obstetric and postnatal care. In other words, um, less sophisticated or well resourced services. Um, for prenatal and postnatal care of pregnant women and newborn babies. Um, and what that means is that there's a, there are all kinds of risks which are increased. There's a, there's a heightened risk of prenatal problems which are not diagnosed. There's a heightened risk of um, problems uh, around birth, uh, which may lead to uh, cerebral palsy or a range of other um, uh, impairments there and there are there are risks as well after in, in the postnatal period the early postnatal period uh, where childhood illnesses may not be diagnosed and in each one of those cases the likelihood then that that illness or birth complication or uh, prenatal problem the likelihood that that will manifest in permanent disability is is increased because of a lower likelihood that things will be diagnosed and treated appropriately and timelessly. Um, add to that, um, in general as well, um, in terms of have accessibility of healthcare, early diagnosis um, of all sorts of conditions, not only in the, uh, you know, around birth, but, but through uh, early and middle childhood is less likely. And if you're less likely to diagnose those conditions, it's more likely that they will manifest in disability. Add to that the fact that in poverty, in impoverished communities, people live in, in poor living conditions, which are, you know, where perhaps there's less, um, where sanitation is not well established and is not of a high standard, um, where living conditions are poor, where people live in cramped conditions. Um, and all of this uh, increases the likelihood of illness which, or disease, which can lead to disability. Children in these sort of environments are, are less likely to have access to clean water um, and also less likely to have access to playing environments which are safe. And so again, e both of those are going to have implications for illness as well as the possibility of injury um, because of playing in places uh, which are not safe. Lastly, but definitely uh, not in any way unimportant is the reality that in impoverished communities, troubled communities, such as many uh, informal communities in this country, um, which are the, where communities themselves are the product of people, of dislocated people, people who have been moved um, for all sorts of reasons, um, you know, possibly to find employment, possibly fleeing difficult circumstances of other sorts in these communities, it's, there is a higher likelihood of criminality and various forms of abuse. And what that does translate into is, 
is the high likelihood of disability. Disability because of injury, because of stabbings, because of um, uh, gunshot wounds. You know, in South Africa, the the the, the, the number one cause of um, of paralysis in men is is gunshot wounds, and so there's a higher likelihood of criminality and various forms of abuse in these communities, which leads to disability. Slide three. So moving on to the question of collaborating with parents uh, of children with disabilities and speaking uh, not, not only, but primarily from the perspective of, of us as professionals working in education. Um, the first thing to note is that parents are absolutely key allies in our work as educationists uh, and in the work generally um, of uh, people who provide services aiming to promote the healthy development of children. Um, parents of the child with a disability know that child better than anybody else. They know the everyday reality um, of what it means to care for that child, of what the child's preferences and needs are, uh, of what the child responds to positively. There's a long history, unfortunately, in, um, <clears throat> in psychology and in other disciplines of thinking about disabil childhood disability in families in a way which tended to be very critical of parents and tended to alienate parents. Uh, and that is a big mistake. We need to, there's an enormous amount to be gained um, by us putting real effort uh, as teachers, as uh, education support workers, as even as uh, education officials of other sorts, principals, there's an enormous amount to be gained by putting real effort and real time into developing alliances with and really collaborative relationships with parents of children with disabilities, so that we can um, we can grow a system uh, around the child um, which is which is unified and which uh, has a common understanding of what is in the best interests of the child's flourishing and healthy development. A key part of this is, uh, uh, is trust and communication. Um, so, and I think those things sort of depend on one another. Um, developing a collaborative relationships with parents, as I said, it takes time and real effort. And what that means is, is sitting down with parents uh, and listening and um, really listening to their experience, to their account of what it's meant to, um, to care for, to give birth to and to grow and to care for this child with disability. Um, as we have these conversations with parents, um, we will discover, and this is also a very important um, aspect to pay attention to, we will discover that many parents will have experienced high levels of trauma um, around managing, caring for their child. And not, and, and well, let me explain, not just not simply in terms of the impairment, but in terms of um, living with the consequences and struggles of having a child with disability. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go back to early on, um, around birth, it's possible that they have a child with a congenital disability where they discovered that the child had a disability either prenatally or at birth or soon uh, after the child was born. Um, and for most parents, that is a, that is a traumatic event, um, you know, where the child who arrives is not the child who was expected, who was imagined. And there's a, a process of adjustment that needs to take place around that. Um, very often and very problematically, um, certainly in South Africa, um, parents don't have enough support in that early period uh, and feel very much alone and abandoned uh, with this new and very sort of unknown um, reality in their lives of having a child who has a disability um, and probably a disability which is unlike any they've been exposed to before. Well, if we think about the fact that and we are all products of segregation, it's very likely that if you have a child who has a disability, it's likely that you haven't in your life 
um, spent a lot of time with an adult or anyone who has that disability and so it feels very new say you have a child with uh, you have a newborn baby who is congenitally blind um, it feels very new and very unknown and so th there's a often a traumatic history uh, around the discovery of disability um, in childhood and which parents could really benefit from speaking about it. and I think making contact with parents and understanding where they're coming from often involves talking through that story but the story doesn't end there um, because very often for parents what what begins there is a much longer story of fighting for the right to access for their child uh, and in particular here I'm talking about fighting for the right to um, appropriate health care health services as well as education and so very often we will meet parents of children with disabilities in our schools who literally have gone through processes of many years um, of struggling going back again and again and again and again to try and get the health care um, which their child needs from uh, a public health system which is failing or under-resourced in their area um, where a child might need ongoing um, rehabilitation such as physiotherapy or speech therapy or um, other forms of rehabilitation uh, and there might there might be limited access or not enough access a child might need surgery might need treatments and parents are in a fight um, to get their child the best possible treatment that in terms of health care in terms of education, um, you will know from my earlier lecture on, in this course that <clears throat> um, approximately 600,000 uh, South African children with disabilities are estimated to be, to be not in any form of schooling. And I can guarantee you <clears throat> that for many or most of those children, parents have tried to get their children into schools. They've gone through long processes of, of banging on doors at their local um, neighborhood schools where possibly their child has been denied access uh, in a way which contra contradicts the constitution and the UNCRPD. Possibly they've been referred to special schools, found themselves on a long waiting list. Um, you know, they've, they've lobbied and campaigned and, and, and had to fight and fight um, to, for their, to get their child access to some form of education. So these are the sorts of stories that parents will bring. If we are going to develop trusting collaborative relationships with them, um, we're gonna to have to take the time as educationists to sit down and listen to those stories and really understand where this child and this family are coming from, what they've been through. Um, giving parents an experience of someone who actually is willing to listen to them is something which in my experience has is very very powerful because very often these parents have had just the opposite they've had the experience of no one wants to listen uh, and closed door after closed door um, in their faces and so there's a lot to be gained um, by creating a very different kind of welcoming relationship these parents. <clears throat> so um, in order to understand, so, so I mean that, that, that's the end of, the, of, of the, the short few points that I, I'm going to make here. Um, and I'm just going to say a few words um, in ending this short lecture uh, about my own project, uh, my own research project, which is <clears throat> investigates the experience uh, of children uh, of uh, families who have children with disabilities who live in poor communities uh, in the Cape Town area uh, and what I've done over the past three years in this project is um, is try to in a sense do at great length and in a lot of depth what I've just described to you a moment ago which is sit parents and families, whole families down um, and ask them to tell me their story about their struggle in a range of domains. Um, uh, their struggle to, uh, to fight for access for their child 
um, to services such as education and employment, you know, education and um, healthcare, <laughs> um, and also to survive and manage as a family uh, in the in the face of all of the economic adversity, uh, which is created by lives of poverty to begin with, um, and then the increased financial and physical and emotional struggle and burden which can um, be created by having a child with disability who has complex needs. And what I've found over the over that time, over the past three years, as we've we've spoken to family after family, um, is the truth of what I've been saying this morning um, in terms of the fact that disability is an enormous issue in these families. Um, but families face such complex adversity that it often is only one problem amongst many others which does interact in a, in a complicating way um, with other forms of adversity, um, often really cementing families into a, a vulnerable position of not being able to escape from poverty. Um, I'll be saying more about the project uh, and my findings on it later in the course, but for now I'll stop there. Thanks for listening.